So good morning, everybody. My name is Lori Dixon, so welcome to our webinar. I have muted all of you, I believe, so when it is time for the q and I'll go ahead and unmute all of you. But if you're not asking questions, it would be great if you stayed mute so that our phone line can be nice and clear for everybody else. So it looks like we have more people joining. Um, I don't have the little dinger that says when people are joining, that's all been turned off. But my counter keeps going up. So I'm going to wait one more minute. And then as a courtesy, we're going to begin talking about child-resistant packaging and some trends and things that are happening in this crazy time. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. So again, if anyone's just joined, welcome. So we're doing a review of some child-resistant protocol testing, things that are happening, and got some trends to share with you and what's going on with cannabis packaging, et cetera. So first of all, um, our thoughts are with all of you and your loved ones during this crazy time right now. Um, but I'm pleased that this is one event that we don't need to cancel. Um, we have had to suspend testing for a short while until things are back to normal, whatever our new normal is. But we're going to wait until it's appropriate to be testing in-house or finding sites. But as soon as it's possible, we're going to start testing again. So for our agenda today, as I said, I appreciate the fact that you'll keep your phone muted even though we will uh, have some Q&A at the end. So the topics that we're going to cover are a general overview of testing protocols. I want to share with you some trends that we're seeing with all of the new packaging coming out and how children are opening them. I'm going to share with you some differences between the uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission, the CPSC, uh, 16 CFR 1700 in comparison to the international standards. We'll look at the, our new certification program and the cannabis packaging, and we'll do some Q&A at the end. So it's going to be a jam-packed 45 minutes to an hour. I am recording this, so if you need to hop off at any point in time, uh, you can go back and find it on our website, and I will also have the web addresses throughout here. So real quickly, as I said, my name is Lori Dixon. I'm the president of Great Lakes Marketing Research. Um, I appreciate the opportunity that I've had to work in this field for so long. Um, I know the benefits of good packaging and the lives that are saved because of the ingenious packages that all of you create because of your commitment to quality and also your respect for the intent of the regulations. So I'm proud to be a part of this industry. As you know, this is National Poison Prevention Week. Um, I am uh, chairman of the National Poison Prevention Week Council. This year we have three themes. Uh, the first one is we want consumers to understand the concept of own it. We want them to take responsibility for what they bring in their home and to take advantage of the good packaging that exists, the safety packaging that's proven to work. We want them to understand how to store products safely, knowing that good packaging is still just the one of several ways to keep children safe. And we encourage the reading of labels. Secondly, we've made a very big effort, as well as all the other organizations, to make sure that consumers have the phone number of the National Poison Control Center handy. So as a member of this industry, I hope that you have it posted throughout your office and especially throughout your home. And the other thing that we want to do is spread the word and create different ways to spread messaging. So this year, we had our second uh, contest for the video contest nationally for poison control. And we had entries from about 50 students whose entry was G, uh, met the requirements and they were able to be judged. And I want to share with you, if I can get it to work, 
the video that is our grand prize winning video. Well, I'm not hearing any audio, so my fear is that you probably are not either. But this was the video <laughs> that went with it, and there was a wonderful voiceover that also went with it. Well, sad to say that didn't work. I practiced it a hundred times and it worked, but this time it chose not to. I will share a link to this though on our website because I want everybody to have the opportunity to watch this in real time because it was a really clever video and it talked about how important poison prevention is. You can see, at least if nothing else, you can see from the animation that it was very clever. Uh, this was done by an eighth grader out of the state of Washington. And um, we were going to have that individual receive an award in Washington, but we were unable to do so because of the uh, regulation. But uh, he was going to come from the state of Washington all the way to D.C. Anyway, I'm going to move on. So we'll talk about the Poison Prevention Packaging Act. And as you know, this regulation is about protecting children. And that's the most important thing, is the regulation addresses substances. It does not regulate packages. So the Consumer Product Safety Commission is given the authority to set the standards. And those standards are doing a great job. The Poison Prevention Packaging Act uh, became a law in 1970. So we're actually celebrating um, 50 years that safe packaging has been in the marketplace. There's a lot of studies proving that the safe packaging is actually working. But we know that this packaging is child resistant. It is not child proof. We know that some children are going to get into the package. So that's why it's really our obligation to correct the media and others who inadvertently say child proof because it really sets the wrong tone. So our messaging of National Poison Prevention Week is that packaging is good, but it is child resistant. It is not child proof. I grabbed some of these images off the websites, um, which I monitor, and you can see the inappropriate use of child proof on a pretty regular basis. And it's very disturbing, so when you do see it, it would be great if you could contact that source and let them know they're using the wrong terminology. Um, I think it's up to us to be vigilant, but also help your PR and your own internal media folks to understand how to use the uh, terminology correctly. So by now, it looks like everybody is on that was expected to be on. So I want to quickly introduce the fact that if you call Great Lakes, you'll either talk to me or you'll talk to Jan or Deb. Jan and Deb are the project managers. You can see they've both been here for many years, and they can answer your questions. But if you have questions that come up, their web uh, or their email addresses are on the screen, and so are their phone numbers. So feel free to get in touch with them or me whenever you need any information. So I want to talk a little bit about the regulations so that it is referenced correctly. So the most important thing is that 1700.15 lists the actual standards, and 1700.20 is the testing procedure for special packaging. So when we get into the meat of the discussion, you'll understand more about the difference between the standard and the actual testing procedure. But again, recall that the CPSC regulates substances. They don't regulate marijuana packaging because that is not a federal substance. However, the 16 CFR 1700 is often referenced by most of the states that have marijuana packaging regulations. So when you are looking at different regulations and they say that it needs to be tested according to 16 CFR 700, this is what they are referring to. If you do testing and you create a certificate of conformity, you'll want to have 16 CFR 1700 noted as the test protocol that you use and be sure to note that it's the standard as well as the special packaging procedures. Just something else to, to make it more clear what I'm talking about. Um, for example, liquid nicotine. Um, there's this public law, and it refers to special packaging for liquid nicotine. But you can see that when they talk about the special packaging, 
they specifically reference that it will meet the standards in 1700.15 and the regulations or the testing uh, procedures in 1700.20. So this is one of many standards that will list the regulation. So it's important that you understand what this regulation is talking about. If you ever need additional information, childresistant.com um, has a lot of the regulations. It's pretty easy to find and there are links to things. So a lot of what I'm going to show you is on uh, that website. I want to talk in more detail to set the stage a little bit more about why you're doing the child resistant package testing. It's essential to keep these in mind because as you prepare your package for testing, you should understand a little bit about why we ask for some of the information that we ask for. So just to note, you do not have to test with a third party, but you do need to have verification that your package meets the standard. So first of all, you're testing to safeguard children. So if you have a regulated substance, your goal is actually to create a package that is safe. That's the most important thing. Secondly, as a responsible manufacturer, you want an effective package. That means that it's compatible with the substance that you put in the package. So think more about chemicals and cleaning supplies, et cetera. So you have to make sure your package is compatible with what other, whatever substance goes in it. But you also have to make sure that that package functions for the expected life of the package. So if you think about a pill container that has a 200 count, for example, you would need data to show that that package is child resistant for 200 openings and closings. The regulation states that you can show that by having some kind of quality control data, but you also might want to have your package opened and closed 200 times before you test. However you choose to meet that requirement, it's important that your package is useful for the entire life of the package. You should also test your package in the configuration that most resembles how it's going to be put into the marketplace. So if you're going to have it heat sealed or if you're going to have a tamper evident material on it until the consumer gets it home, et cetera, if you believe at all that those materials might interfere with a child resistant feature, then we need to test under the scenario of it having potentially some tamper evident materials put on it as it's leaving your factory or your manufacturing site. Um, but before we test it, we'll remove those child, or we'll remove the tamper evident materials. But it's important that when we remove them, those tamper evident materials, that your package still retains its child resistant features. So that's what we are referring to when we're saying under those likely scenarios. The test results are the main deliverables. So the report must fully explain the test methodology. The protocols are standard, but how the packages are prepared uh, must be documented. So a lot of what we ask you when we begin testing is how the packages have been prepared for testing so that we can have that in the report. And we'll also discuss this a little bit later, but if a problem would ever occur with the package in the unlikely event of a lawsuit or something else happening, you would need to provide those test data. And it's going to be important that the report reflects test data from the package that was actually put into the retail channel. So I want to share with you a little bit about getting ready to do the testing and the processes to prepare for testing. So the first thing that happens is we typically get a phone call and we're, we will ask you about your package, the substance that you plan to put in your package, if you're putting a substance in it, um, your timing, et cetera. Um, we like to look at a package beforehand, before we begin testing, so that we feel that it's logical to test. We can ask you questions about how to get it ready to test. Um, we can determine if it needs a resecuring test or just a senior and adult test. We will also look at risk factors associated with the package. Because remember, these are tested in nursery schools and child care centers, and children have 10 minutes to work on these. So we have to make sure that that package is safe for children to be working on it in a nursery school or child care center. And we always want to get a setup form completed from you. After we get the packages, we can either prepare them for you, but we'll definitely check them to make sure that there was 
uh, no harm in how they were shipped, whether they were assembled or unassembled. We want to look at the placebo, if you're using a placebo. Um, in Canada, you're required to use a placebo. In the US, you may or may not use a placebo. But just remember again that any kind of placebo has to be safe to take into a school, which means it can't have allergens, et cetera. Um, we can, as I said, we'll prep the package for you or you can prepare it. But when I'm talking about package prep, we're talking about having the cap put on at the right torque value. Um, it might be filled with water or some other placebo. But then to make sure it is child resistant for the life of that package, it may need to be opened and closed however many times it's expected to be used in the marketplace. And then we brief our testers so that they're ready to keep an eye out for any specific issues uh, unique to your package. When the testing begins, um, we start with either the children or the adults for the non-resecure test, if we do an adult panel and a child panel. Um, we typically would recommend that we start with whatever group that you think is going to have the most challenges. So if it's a complicated package to open, maybe the adults will struggle with directions. So we would like to do those first so we can make sure the directions are working. If you think that the children may be able to access it, we might test it first with the children to make sure that in fact it is child resistant. But we'll talk that through with you. Uh, during the testing process, you'll receive updates and you will get them a couple times a week. If it's trending poorly, we'll keep you abreast of that. A little bit later in this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, packaging trends. So we'll be able to show you um, trends by age so that when we're looking at who's opening your packages, we might get some early warning if there's a problem with it. And then when we generate that report, it needs to have all of the required information so that it meets the regulation. And again, we, we will solicit all of that information from you ahead of time. And potentially, you will need to publish a certificate of conformity, and we can provide you a template to do that. So we begin with a setup form, something like this. At the top of the form, is all of the contact information that we need, but also your report needs to list where the company is located, where the packages were made, where the packages were prepped, et cetera. So all of this provides that traceability necessary. And then this form is kind of nice because it asks you to think about some things. So when I'm um, you know, reviewing the package with you and we're asking for your package preparations, et cetera, and how many times it's been cycled. Um, going through the form actually helps us remember things we need to do or things that we want to make sure are recorded correctly. At the bottom there, where it talks about the package type, the type of package that you test will influence the testing process. So for example, on a reclosable package or a continuous thread package, um, we wanna make sure that the torque value is in the report. We want to know what your expected um, number of uses might be so that we can cycle it correctly. Um, if the caps were applied, we need to know the date and time because they have to rest for 72 hours. So, this little part at the bottom is just our way of making sure that we don't miss anything and that it reminds you that these are factors that either have to be documented or things that you need to think about. The second page of our form is to help us get the exact package identification because it's essential to the report that all of this information be there. There's a checklist to make sure that if you've got somebody helping you, you can keep abreast of all of the different steps that need to be taken and what you need to send to us. And then we will also, um, at the bottom part, um, these are the things that we will provide to you. And then we ask for your signature because that's part of our accreditation, that we've agreed that this is the package we're testing and how we're testing it. But we're pretty, pretty specific with our setup forms. We wanna make sure that you can fill it out and that you're comfortable with the kind of testing that's being done. So we ask all that information because we have to test it exactly as the regulations suggest. Um, so it 
it helps us understand what you're expecting and it helps you understand what we are expecting. If we go through this child panel real quickly, this, this is what I was talking about, that way back in 1970 when these regulations were put in place, they actually were done very well. And the child panel composition, as you can see as I'm unfolding on the right, there's a lot of uh, restrictions on the child panel. So we can only test children in a certain ages, certain genders, there's package type restrictions, site and tester limitations, et cetera. All of these um, regulations, they allow us to have a panel that is very well defined, which makes this test very robust and it makes it reliable. The validity piece, in essence, making sure that we're testing a package that represents what's in the marketplace, the validity piece is where we really work hard to make sure that the package we are testing in the format we are testing it is what's going to enter the marketplace. The protocol is also very specific. We test children in pairs. The wording is very specific and limited. When we provide a demonstration, it's the motions only, no words and the test lasts for exactly 10 minutes or until the contents, contents have been accessed. So when I say we use the exact words, I know it makes a lot of us cringe, but in yellow there you can see that we do tell children after five minutes, if they haven't used their teeth yet, that they can try and open the package uh, with their teeth. And this is the requirement in the 16 CFR 1700 and for Canada. However, it is not a requirement with the international standards. I think this is probably the main reason why the Consumer Product Safety Commission does not accept test protocols from the ISO procedure. That's why you have to use um, the U.S. testing standard for the U.S. packages. So the key thing is when do you get to pass and when do you fail? So there's the first five minute test period and the second five minute test period, which is typically referred to as before the demonstration and after the demonstration. So what you're looking for is your sequential test, pass, fail, or continue ranges. So if your package passes both the criteria for the first five minutes and after 10 minutes, then you can stop testing and you report with a panel of 50 children. However, if you fall in that continue range in either the first five minutes or the 10 minute total test, then you would use another panel of 50 children. That's why these are referred to as sequential tests because you're moving from panel one to panel two to panel three as needed. Now the Consumer Product Safety Commission, 16 CFR 1700, that's a panel of 50 children minimum. The international standards in Canada allow 30 as the smallest sample size and it increases from there. If in the unlikely event you would go to a panel of 200, you can see what the pass-fail rates are from here. But the main factor is if you look down there at that 80% after 10 minutes, the goal is that the package is resistant to 80% of the children, which is why they, they are considered child-resistant packages and not child-proof packages. Um, the Canadian standard and the ISO standards do not move forward in sequential panels of 50. You would just add children, so you can end those tests anytime after 30 children until you meet the passing level. The other thing that's important is you look at the 80%. What it's saying is the goal is that 80% of the children are not able to access the package. So if you do a resecure test, which I'm about to talk about, remember that the goal is 80% of the packages that were properly closed are child resistant. So let's look at that senior panel. Just like the child panel was very specific, the senior panel composition is also very specific. The ages are defined very carefully, the gender mix, 
there's tester and site requirements, and there's also package type requirements. It is also very robust, but realistically, we know there's more variance in the adult population than in the child population. So we do a full panel of 100 senior adults, no matter um, what the pass-fail is. It's always a minimum of 100. What's interesting with the seniors is there's really two kinds of tests. There's the senior panel that's used for a single dose or packages in which the closure is visually or audibly confirmed. So think about a package in which you snap it closed or you shut the box or you turn on or like a squeeze and turn and you hear a little snap. Those are the audible or visual cues that the package is closed. For this test, the senior is given five minutes to open their package. The goal of this is if it's a new or an innovative package, they have five minutes to figure out how to open it. Then they have 60 seconds on the second round to open and close the package. And we need to have 90% uh, of them successfully open and close the package in one minute. However, if you think about the other kind of package, which is more of a continuous thread package, so think of your typical push down and turn where they are torque dependent, they have to open that first package in five minutes, same as what I said. Now their second package, they open and close it in 60 seconds. That ends the senior portion of a resecure test. Then the next phase is that we have to make sure it was closed correctly and we verify that it was closed correctly by allowing children to see if they can open it. If you're familiar with the continuous thread packages, no doubt you yourself have noticed that if you close that package and you don't close it correctly, it really isn't child resistant anymore. Now, go back to what I said a second ago about our goal is 80% child resistant. When you calculate the pass-fail rates for a continuous thread package like this, the assumption is that 80% of the kids should pass. So 20% could, in theory, open even a properly closed package. So the goal of this verification phase is to make sure that if more than 20% of the children can open it. You start to look at it as a package that cannot be closed or is typically not closed correctly. So um, that is how the calculation. If you're interested more in how that's calculated, just give me a call and I can certainly go through that with you. So that's the protocol test. Um, you know, if you look at the regulation, it's quite detailed, but I'd like to move on now and talk a little bit more about some trends that we're seeing. So I call this our story of little hands, teeth, and older ladies. I'm allowed to say oh, I fall into those categories, so I'll say older, older ladies. But I want to share some data that talk about how children are using their hands, how they use their teeth. Some of the struggles that we have with the older female adults not closing packages and some conclusions that might help you as you are doing your packaging development. Some trends that we're seeing by the ASTM type. What I mean by ASTM type is that ASTM has taken all of the child resistant teachers and they've created a classification code. So we have to record the classification code of the package in our database so we can do some analysis by classification code. So if you look at a lug finish, which is a type two ASTM classification, these lugs are the most child resistant. When I think of a lug, think of like a friendly and safe package or a squeeze and turn, something that is not torque dependent, but it gets twisted on somehow and then it snaps into place. These packages we have found to be the most resistant, child resistant, compared to the other types of packages, specifically the snap packages and the continuous thread. So they have the highest expected pass rate. And the closing is audible or visual. 
so we can see when the package is closed, but then so can the user of the package. In a case like this, you don't do a resecure test. You do a senior panel test and a child test. A snap closure is the kind, think of when you put the cap on, you make sure that the arrow can fit into the little slot and you snap it on. When you're opening it, you're aligning the arrow with the gap and then you're pushing up. These are also uh, typically child resistant at about 92%. So that is also um, a pretty solid package, not quite as effective as the lugs. The continuous thread push and turns, they typically tend to be the least child resistant because of the resecure test. The issue with the continuous thread push and turn packages is typically because the senior adults do not close them correctly. Part of the specific wording in the test protocol is that we say, please open and properly close this package according to the directions on the, typically the cap. But we are not allowed to say, close it really, really tight because kids are in the household. So sometimes the seniors think it's closed and it's really not. And that's the greatest challenge with the continuous thread packages over time is that the older ladies are not closing them tight enough. So let's talk about a tale of little hands. Some of the things that we're also seeing is when you have a child resistant package in your hands and you're trying to figure out how to open it, as an adult, you will typically look at the directions, you'll place your fingers where the directions tell you to place them, you'll squeeze and do exactly what they tell you at the location on those packages you're supposed to do it, like an adult. However, when you're trying to test to see if a package is child resistant, you've got to think like a kid. And you've got to think like a kid on that child's birthday morning, and they've got presents in front of them, boxes and ribbons, buttons and bows, and they are going to rip and tear and get at the contents. So if you're thinking like a kid and you've got some kind of a package, you need to think that that kid is going to begin ripping and tearing just like it was you know, their birthday morning, or it was a box of candy or something else that they really want to get into. So they're using their hands and their teeth to rip at seams and weak edges and anything else where they can get their teeth or their fingers and just start pulling at it. So my recommendation always is when you get a child resistant package in front of you and you're just checking to see how durable or how uh, resistant it might be, start to think like a kid on birthday morning and tear it and rip at it and you'll see what a child will do. So if you're into data, which of course we are over here at my company, I want to share with you some of the trends that we're seeing. Across the top is looking at the data by the male or the female child who is part of the panel. And then down the side is the type of package. So that 1A is what I just talked about, is the continuous thread in which it's torque dependent. The type 2 is that lug finish where you know if it's closed or not. And type three is your typical snap cap where you align and push up. So what we're typically finding is that for those continuous thread packages, there is a difference between how males and females, little girls and little boys are opening the package. And the boys are slightly more likely to get into those continuous thread packages. However, what's very important is that there's not a difference by gender in the other package types. So when you are looking at your data and you see openings um, in the continuous thread, you may see a trend toward male opening them more. So if you look at your partial panel and you've got a lot of boys that were tested, you might start to be realistic about how the package is performing. On some of the other types of packaging, whether it's open by your male or female, you wouldn't expect to see very many differences. So we use these data to help us help you understand if a package is trending well or not trending well as we progress with the testing. If we look at those same package types, but we look at it by the month of the child, there's a few other trends that really help us understand what's going on. 
Uh, the first one is looking on the where I just circled. There is no difference between these older children when they're opening that continuous thread type package. But if you start to see openings of the continuous thread package with those younger kids, you'd, you'd think, okay, I shouldn't have very many openings overall with younger kids. So if you start to see them there, there's a little warning flag that says, hey, this isn't going very well. The 1A packages we see get opened more by the older kids because it takes a little more strength because they're torque dependent and the understanding of the turning and turning and turning. And they're getting that constant reinforcement typically of a clicking sound. The other thing that's interesting is all of the other types of packages, the more new and ingenious types of packages, um, sort of the innovative things, various sizes of packages, you can see that there's a direct correlation that the older kids are more likely to get into them, older meaning 49 to 51 months. But there are uh, differences, statistical differences in the age of the children in those packages. We are typically crediting that to the fact that these newer, more innovative packages take a little bit more intelligence and a little bit more trial and error, and the older children have a little bit more stick to it in how they're working on them. But again, these trends allow us to help you understand how your data are progressing when we're moving through our sequential panels. The main thing to understand um, with these data sets is that the openings by age are uh, the most important to look at. That's our highest correlation is the openings uh, by age more so than gender. So when we do partial panels, like if you want to just figure out if a package might do well, it's more important that we look at the panel by age than by gender. That's a relatively new phenomenon because years and years ago we always used to recommend testing with older males and now we're finding that just testing with older children is a good proxy uh, without trying to pick out just the, the little boy participants. Now we'll move on to our tale of a story by teeth. So if we look at the tale of teeth, um, what we're finding here that's very important is that um, using your teeth before there's a demonstration, so before they're told they can use their teeth if they want to, you can see that use of the teeth falls between 5 and 7% for children. So they're using their teeth, but they're not aggressively using their teeth. However, after the demonstration, the children who haven't used their teeth are told, you can use your teeth if you want to. So the demonstration is just visual of them opening the package correctly, and then we say, you can use your teeth if you want to, and you can see how the numbers really increase, that nearly half of the children are using their teeth in some way to open the package. This is an important little conversation because in the ISO standards, uh, they do not say specifically you can use your teeth. Only the US and Canada have the statement you can use your teeth. In the ISO standards, you're not allowed to discourage use of teeth, but you don't specifically offer that. If we go just one more step looking at the teeth, you can see that in different packages, the use of teeth varies a little, but for the most part, regardless of the package, somewhere around 7% or so of the older children are going to be putting that package in their mouth using their teeth, and somewhere around half of the kids are going to be putting the package in their mouth after they've been told they can do so. Um, again, even though I know we want to act like adults, if you've got a package and you're looking to see how child resistant it is and your teeth are sturdy enough to do it, I would try and open it with your teeth because that's more representative of what's probably going to happen when the kid gets it. So what we're learning then is for the type 1A packages, that's our continuous thread type packages, um, if they use their teeth, they are statistically more likely to open the package. 
So the fact that they're given permission to do so does increase the likelihood of them opening the package. For the type three packages, which were those SNAP packages, if they use their teeth, they are also statistically more likely to open the package. So kids that are naturally gonna start using their teeth, um, the more quote unquote interested in opening it, um, you're gonna see a higher likelihood that they can get into the package. Now we'll do a tale of the older ladies. And this is all a function of the fact that it's a re-secure test to make sure that they are actually closing the package correctly. So with our um, data here, again, if we look at the months of the children, so across the top row, we're looking at 42 to 44 month old children, the 45 to 48, the 49 to 51 month old children. The first row of data show that all of the packages that are closed by females, between 10 and 15 of, 10 to 15 percent of the children are going to open the package, all of them that are closed by females. However, when you look at those closed by the younger females, you get that third row of data. And here, you can see that there's really, there's no difference here between the two younger age categories, opening packages closed by the younger females, because typically the younger females are closing it correctly, and they're keeping out that middle age group of children from opening. But if you look at the packages closed by the older females, you can see now that that middle group of kids, the 45 to 48 month old kids, they are emulating more what the older kids can do. So the bottom line is we definitely see a pattern that the older female adults are not closing the package as effectively as the younger females. So in conclusion, with our little hands, we know that age is a more relevant predictor of the ability to open a package. With our little teeth, you must anticipate that teeth will be used. And to make the most stringent test, we do say you may use your teeth if you want to, according to the regulation, the US regulation. And with the older ladies, we know that the older females are most likely not to close the continuous thread packages sufficiently. So, given all of that, I wanted to just share a few things about um, how industry might want to interpret the phrase, a reasonable testing program. So I'm gonna focus on the US standard, but 16 CFR is um, a set of standards, packaging standards. And the CPSC has always given guidance that has said, you need to have a reasonable testing program. So there are three elements in my interpretation of a reasonable testing program. The first is that you understand your obligation to have a safe and effective package in the market, which is what we went over at the beginning of our discussion. Secondly, you need to know how your package functions in its most likely scenario with respect to how it's used, how it is stored, the product that's put in the package, et cetera. And third, you must document your reasonable testing program so that if the Consumer Product Safety Commission has reason to want to look at your information or your data, you have it available to share. Um, to help with this, we have developed a certification program and it's a 17065 accredited certification program. And the value of this is we're helping to review with you your testing protocols and your testing procedures to make sure that you meet the intent of the regulation and have a reasonable testing program. So with the certification program, um, it is a multi-step program, but um, after you have your package tested by an accredited lab, you go through the certification program to have that reviewed, and then you can list your package on the website that shows it's a child-resistant package. So companies that are looking for child-resistant packages can go to the website, find a listing, and they can actually 
purchase packages that are in fact child resistant and meet the regulations of the intent and the Consumer Product Safety Commission standards. So if you're interested, I wanna talk about cannabis and some of the international regulations. So I did this at the end because if you, this isn't of interest to you, you can hop off, you won't hurt my feelings. But I'm just gonna share five minutes worth of the cannabis testing and the international standards. Um, first of all, in Canada, the Packaging and Labeling Guide for Cannabis in Canada that comes from Health Canada specifically states that you have to meet the requirements set forth in C.01.001 paragraphs 2 and 4 of the FDR. If you look at the FDR, in essence, that references 16 CFR 1700. So the bottom line is that packaging for cannabis in Canada meets their regulation if you test according to 16 CFR 1700 and document it correctly. It also references the ISO standards. So for Canada, it's pretty clear. However, in the United States, it's regulated at the state level. Uh, many states reference 16 CFR 1700. Um, some of them reference it incorrectly, which is what I was alluding to at the beginning of our conversation. But for the most part, if you test according to 16 CFR 1700, you will meet the intent of the states for packaging for cannabis. ASTM also has a labeling and packaging standard they are currently working on it, and the intent of that is that it will mirror 16 CFR 1700 also, so that the packaging can be standardized. So that's just a quick update on the cannabis packaging. There's more information on the website childresistant.com. With respect to the international standards, we have produced this comparison chart. It's also on childresistant.com and it lists the different regulations across the top and some of the variances with respect to the testing protocol. It does not go into what substances, et cetera, are regulated. It just goes into the different standards that exist across the globe, the main ones. A real simple um, example is that in the US, we need a minimum of 50 kids, as I was sharing before, and Canada and ISO and the EN standards, the minimum is 30 kids. What we do is we've analyzed this and we will test according to the most stringent for each one of the standards so that you can do one test and the report will reference how it meets the nuances of all of the standards. So even though some of the standards require only 30 kids, we will always do 50 so that you exceed their minimum. Other examples are, um, as I said, you don't need to make the statement you can use your teeth. Um, however, the most stringent of all of these is to make the statement, so we do so. And um, ISO standards, they actually have a few screening questions for senior adults that 16 CFR doesn't have, but we go ahead and ask those screening questions because that's more stringent. So that's been our philosophy of how we've gone through to make sure that if we produce a report that references the other standards, that we have met or exceeded all of the standards. By now, you're probably thinking that I've spoken enough on this magical St. Patrick's Day. So I want to share with you that if you go on to the cpsc.gov website, there are a lot of helpful tools. Um, there are some Q&A pages, and you can always go there. Um, one of the main things that the CPSC makes clear is that it does not accept um, ISO testing, et cetera. So if you're submitting data to the CPSC, you need to use the U.S. standard. One of the most frequent questions that's asked is whether or not you need to test all sizes or just some of the sizes. So if you make a whole family of products, the uh, CPSC staff in the past, uh, last year on this type of a webinar, they have suggested that they would like to see you test the largest size, the smallest size, and one in the middle. But their goal is that you have a reasonable test process.
program. So if you only make a couple of sizes, you might want to do some other kind of testing or bench data to determine which packages you want tested. Our recommendation is to always test, look at your data, and then determine what sizes you might want to test based on how children are accessing the package, if they are. So if you find that they're most able to open it with their teeth, then you might want to look at sizes that are more likely to be opened with the teeth, et cetera. So we provide guidance in that direction. But generally, you need to look at um, the smallest, the largest, and one of the middle sizes. One of the other questions that always comes up is about retesting. The main thing is if you do anything with your package that influences the child-resistant feature, you should test it again. Um, our accredited certification program does certify for five years, and then you need to resubmit the package and data to prove that the package and the materials and the molds, et cetera, are the same as when you originally got certified. But the general comment from CPSC staff has been that if you change the material that was used or anything that could influence how it's opened and closed, then you should test it again to make sure that that change has not influenced how it works. Another common question has always been um, the idea of cycling or opening and closing the package. The concept of cycling or opening and closing the cap before you test is strictly to make sure that it is child resistant for the life of the product. It's referred to um, many different ways across the regulations. Um, it's also, the staff, CPSC staff, is also often called it cycling. It could be referred to as opening and closing. Uh, many cannabis regulations refer to it as a lifetime child-resistant feature. Um, however it's referred to, the goal is that you have data to show that, in fact, your package will last, last for the expected life of the product. So with that, I want to thank you very much. If you've got any questions at all, um, say, if you think of anything, just shoot us an email or call. Um, this will be on our website so that you can um, go back and refer to it or share the information with others. So at this point, I am going to hit the unmute. And if anybody has a question, feel free just to pipe up. And I'll give it a whirl to try and answer it. Otherwise, I wish all of you a happy St. Patrick's Day. Stay healthy. And if you need any um, other information, you can check our website or go back and listen to this webinar again. And there is our contact information. So in light of nobody saying anything and being courteous of everybody else that would like to Hi Laurie, you. it's Brenda. Hey Brenda. Hey, do you um have you seen any trends or anything you can share on these new um laundry packet um closures, either the containers or the, or I'm, I'm more interested in the, uh, the pouches with those zipper thingies? Um, the main thing that we are learning from those zipper thingies, which I'm glad we're using technical terms because that's, <laughs> that's about where I am right now. Um, with those, the main factor is that if that bag is going to be opened and closed for the 30 little packets that are in there, then prior to testing with children, it needs to be opened and closed 30 times. We're finding that in some designs, and I want to be careful how I say this, we have tested some that have been excellent, high quality, and they last. We have tested some that are not, um, and they don't last for those for the intended life cycle of the product. So prepping the packages correctly is very important. Thank you. Um, I also found it interesting that you were saying that the uh, the lug style is more robust than the uh, push and turn style. It lasts but with the kids as it, far as yeah, as far as how the um, child panels respond to it, and it's a function of if they're not closed correctly by the seniors. Right, right. Okay. Issue. 
thanks for reminding me on that. That's yeah, that's the biggest issue. All right. Well, thank all of you for joining us. And I do welcome any additional questions. You can just email us or call me when I hang up the phone, or you can interrupt me right now because you're all unmuted. But otherwise, I will wish you a wonderful day. And it was a pleasure getting able to share some information with you. Have a safe and happy holiday. Bye.